Hello. Hi, Jordan. Thanks for joining us. Hello. Thank you very much. We, so we normally start these conversations by asking people to introduce who they are and what it is that they do. Um, so maybe you'd like to start with that. Yeah, okay. Um, my name's Jordan Buckner. I'm a, what I would refer to as an artist filmmaker um, from the southeast of England. I mainly work with animation, so my main medium is animation. Um, and I'm also a lecturer at the University of Portsmouth in um, art direction for animation, I think is the, the actual title, which basically just means how you make animation look interesting and engaging. I wondered if you, um, I mean, what, what, when you talk about that kind of idea of animation and animated film, what is involved in doing that, in putting together animation or? Yeah, okay, so I guess that was something I, I should kind of preempt actually, because I am, it, the kind of term artist filmmaker, the reason that's kind of the word that I would use is because I'm from an independent school of animation. So um, traditionally animation is big studio work where you have lots and lots of people um, making a film all together, lots and lots of moving parts. And my work is very specifically on my own. So I work in this basement, as you can see, this lovely basement. Um, essentially making a film from script and storyboard all the way through to the final rendered film, so the kind of composite of the film. Um, and so I, I kind of cover all of the different sectors of animation, unlike what um, most people would do, which is you do one very specific thing. So most people that go into industry are a character animator or they're a rigger or they do something very specific within the kind of pipeline of animation um my whole kind of love for animation i guess came from the idea that from an independent basis you can make a film entirely on your own without anybody else um you don't need a camera person you don't need uh you do need people obviously to make sure you don't have a breakdown and kind of ensure that the details can get played out but largely you can make everything that you want on screen completely on your own um so the the kind of the work i'm interested in is independent in nature whereas traditional animation i guess um if you look at the wider animation world it's largely kind of kids tv and commercials so lots and lots of advertising and that was never anything I was interested in. And I went to an art school. And so animation was a medium that allowed me to kind of enact a vision in a kind of variety of different ways. And so I guess for me, animation is the idea of being able to take something from my head and produce it in as grand a way as I want to um, without kind of any limitations at all um, in a very like independent individual way. Um, and it, it's, it's also, a, for me, a medium that straddles kind of every single aspect of the arts that I love. So it's filmmaking and painting and drawing and storyboarding. It's kind of all of the different interests I had as a kid or as a like young student then can just be put into one project. So it, it, I, I guess that's the, the part for me that I've always kind of fallen in love with is the idea that I can do everything that I love in one project and never feel like I'm just doing a very repetitive task. Yeah, hopefully yeah. that helps. That's interesting. It makes it sound, you know, kind, kind of punk, I suppose, in the idea of this <laughs> DIY aesthetic in something that, at least for me coming to it from the outside, looks doesn't look punk. It looks polished and, you know, yeah. produced. And yeah, so I don't know, that's, that's kind of fascinating that it, it, yeah, it can be done on that, on such a small scale. Um, I mean, when you um, when you, you were talking about going to art school, and um, what are the what are the sorts of things that got you? Sorry, there's going to be a really loud siren. Okay. Hells of living on a main road. Um, yeah. So, what are the sorts of things that um, shape the the work that you're doing beyond this kind of ability to control the different media involved? What are the influences on the types of animation that you're interested in producing? Um. Well, I've always, like, thematically, there's a few things that the work is about. So, so far, the two big, I say big, they're, they're very small films, but from an independent perspective, they're huge. 
Um, so the two big films I've made are a film called Sleeper and a film called When the Tides Went Down. And they were both made... Which is um, available on, uh, on BBC iPlayer, right? Is that yes, it is. Yes, check it out. <laughs> um, it's... The, the first one's available on BFI Player and the second one's available on BBC iPlayer. And they were funding schemes um, to allow independent creators to kind of make their first pieces of work outside of the kind of university context. And they center around similar themes, but my work is quite abstract, I guess, in the sense that I'm interested in... Um, I guess work like someone like Andre Tarkovsky, like a, a kind of poetic cinema, but also a cinema that is, there's enough abstraction in the work for it to reflect back at the audience. Um, so there are themes of kind of mental health and grief and um, climate change and kind of how we come to terms with the existential world around us, I guess. Um, but there's also a kind of push to make sure that none of those things are too defined within the film. So my first film, Sleeper, most people watched that film and were kind of like enthralled by it, but also I got a lot of people saying like, what the hell was that about? Um, and that was always by design. Like I, I'm interested in the space that a film can create for a specific viewer so that you can watch a film now or in a hundred years and that one person watching that experience can have a relationship with it that is maybe not anything I ever intended, but there is space for that to happen. Um, so thematically, I'm interested in, in those kind of themes. Um, and independent animation was the only place for that to happen because commercial animation is largely, um, like I said, even if it's not kids TV and commercials, it's reductive in a certain sense in that it, you, you have to make work that has a mass appeal um, and you're seeing a broadening of animation that's slowly starting to catch up and do more interesting stuff largely just because the audience is changing as well that animation is a thing that now is understood by adults rather than just children um, but i guess my big influences were Partly people like, um, who would they be? They'd be like the Brothers Quay, who did a, a film called The Streets of Crocodiles, um, kind of old stop motion, sinister films. Um, but also kind of people like David Lynch. Some of David Lynch's early work was animation. And in there's a film called The Art Life, which is a documentary about David Lynch. And I, I've only seen that recently in the last year or so. It's not that old. But in that film, he talks about the idea that animation allowed him to... It was the first time he realised that you could bring a painting to life, that he worked largely with paintings, and then suddenly animation allowed this opportunity to bring kind of static images into a new kind of way of seeing the world. Um, and he that sounds like a really simplistic conclusion. Like the idea that at 30, he went like, oh my God, you can make paintings move. But I think for me, it was a very similar thing. Like I, I drew and painted and I loved image making and storytelling through um, kind of individual imagery. Um, and then the idea that those images could then from my own craft kind of pop out into whole worlds was kind of interesting. Um, and just the thing that I kind of get lost in, like making a painting and the stories that come out of just working on a, a piece of art is normally where my films start from. I don't start in a very kind of traditional way of writing a script. It normally comes from lots and lots of image making, lots and lots of painting and drawing, and then stories kind of appear in that quality. Um, and also I, one thing that I have always felt like a slight cheat about is that um, I I was never like an animation person. When I went to university, I wasn't the kid who was like obsessed with Disney or Pixar or any of the kind of big animation studios. I, I, I went into the course because I did a foundation year and I loved the experience of it. And I was gonna do product design just because that's what people have told me to do. 
and then my tutor said you love doing all of these things if you thought of doing animation and it wasn't anything other than this allows me to do all of these things together um so most of my kind of inspirations before that point were from film rather than from animation so um i guess people like tarkovsky um filmmakers where there was an abstractness and a poetry around their work um, and then that later evolved into a kind of passion for stuff like slow cinema and um, cinema that allowed the viewer to breathe. Um, and that's becoming a more prevalent thing now, but it, it has always felt like a bit of a cheat because none of, when people say like, what inspired your films, very rarely is it other animation. Um, and sometimes it's, sometimes it's film, but often it's more just, I make images and those images feel like there's a story there to be told. And that's kind of partly how the process develops, but partly how the inspiration forms. It's kind of a strange relationship of me not being wholly in control. Um, there, there's some sort of element of making the work that it's though, I think David Lynch talks about it as though there's um, someone in a different room and they're, they're kind of flipping a puzzle piece at you each time. And every time I make artwork, it does feel a bit like a new puzzle piece kind of just lands on the table and you don't know what to do with it. But so that, that's kind of where the starting points came from. And that's really interesting. That, that kind of throws up, um, I guess, a, a couple of questions um, from, from what you just said. I mean, we've had a, a lot of contributors actually, either because it's really central to what they do or because just in the course of the conversation, it turns out that it's, obliquely central to what they do talk about narrative in the way that um you kind of mentioned there and i mean i'm from a, a discipline in a period of uh, research in 16th and 17th century literature where that question of representation and media is um is really at the forefront of what you know people like shakespeare for instance are doing um when they're interested in how, how can painting be represented in poetry um so you get that that similar sort of transition across media and um, from, um, from what you were you know you were talking about a lot of that if I correct me if I've, if I've not got this right but a lot of that kind of inspiration is about moving things between different types of media um, and you use the phrase kind of world making which I really like um, so how do you kind of build build a world out of these different things um, and I guess I, I kind of wonder where narrative sits in that um, while still being allowed to, uh, while still allowing the person viewing it to kind of dwell in that um, slow space and that slow cinema space and find the abstractness that's there. Um, so do you, do, do you think that, you know, these things tell stories in perhaps more complicated ways? Than... Yeah, I, I, I definitely am interested in, I guess everything I do I see as narrative. So whether it's a sketch in a sketchbook or a painting, for me, it's, it's a way of kind of opening a window into storytelling and sometimes that's from a kind of um a therapeutic method of like trying to figure out narratives from your own life and figure out what what your work is telling you about your your life and most of the time especially when i was a student actually i would make a film as part of a student project and then i would get to two or three years later and then figure out, oh, wait a second, that was about this thing. Like at the time, I just felt like I was making a story. And then years later, it kind of helped me figure out really what I was thinking or what I was feeling about a certain point in my life. Um, one thing that I do think is interesting that you brought up there that I find a really interesting change about animation in a previous generation and animation now is that in previous generations, and um, one of my hatreds for the industry or for my hatreds a strong word um, but one of my issues with kind of how animation is presented to the world is that it's got this um quality of people kind of keeping the gate shut um and that you have to be very very specialized and specific to even enter the room and have a conversation and i've met lots of people from um a generation above me I would say in the animation world obviously some amazing inspirational people but also people that kind of are very reductive in their thinking in that animation constitutes this or it constitutes this and it can only be done 
in this very specific way. It can only be drawn on paper or it can only be done with stop motion. And I think for myself and hopefully for the generation that I've kind of grown up with, it's actually way more exciting to blend those skills together. So I use a piece of software called Autodesk Maya, which is a kind of 3D modeling software. It's kind of high tech, complicated software is how I would see it when I was a student. Um, but I also use Photoshop like 2D overlays or I'll do uh, painted textures on paper and scan them in. And so this line between kind of 2D animation, 3D animation, stop motion. Um, if you look at my film Sleeper, for example, that's animated on twos, which means that the characters moved every second frame have this slightly jerkier movement to traditional animation which is animated on one so every frame is this kind of perfect blend between motion and that comes from stop motion um, and you're seeing a rise of I think largely in the independent space because a it's a restriction on time like we don't have the time to be able to be as fine-tuned as bigger places but also just a lack of care for the kind of what came before like I'm interested in just telling stories. I'm not interested in what some old bloke said 40 years ago animation was supposed to be. Um, and largely, I think that's come from the fact that those people that are held up in the animation industry as kind of the, the gods, as it were, um, they're, they're kind of largely, they might have interesting technical approaches, they might have interesting ideas, but the work that was presented to me from them was never interesting. It was kind of talking rabbits and stuff like that, that kind of never had an impact on me. So the idea that they seem to be the kind of the people that looked after the, the realm of animation seemed, seemed like nonsense to me. And there was, um, there's an Irish animator called David O'Reilly, who was a kind of huge inspiration when I left university because he wrote a paper called Basic Animation Aesthetics, which was a kind of changing point. And it's a very short paper, um, a very simple idea, but in it he talks about how animation is like a Pandora's box that's never really been opened. It's just been done in the same way as we were kind of told about. And it's exciting now to see just a generation of people not caring about what they're supposed to do and instead just going well i know how to do stop motion and i know how to do this other approach i'm just going to fuse them together and see what happens and i think that's where the exciting work's going and that's why you're seeing animation now start to look a lot different than how it did even 10 years ago like there's just a, a raft of stuff that is more interesting um not only in its aesthetic appeal but in its kind of thematic appeal because you're you're getting people in the space telling stories that are not stories that we'd heard before um so i'm i'm definitely a key um i guess that that's part of the world that i'm keen to share with like when i teach at university one thing i'm keen to share with students is that this is a realm well, a realm's a stupid way of looking at it but this is a world in which you can the rules still haven't been set there's still no there's a groundwork here but there's still so much to kind of open up and explore um and that's, I guess that's what kind of excites me about watching students make work is that you see them do a thing that you've never seen anyone do before. Um, and in fact, I, I, I've got a, a graduate student who's just finished her major project um, at university this year. And at the start of the project, she was going into that using photography techniques that she'd not kind of thought about before or, or not seen as part of in, an integral part of her animation. And she brought into her work kind of walking into the dark in terms of like, I don't know how this will look. And the final film just, it looks great, but it's also stunning to see someone kind of take steps into the dark and just think, I just want to see what happens when I do these things. So that kind of the breaking down of those barriers, I think is really, really crucial for me. And the idea of not that just being an aesthetic thing, but the idea that the world is opening up to people that aren't, like me like white blokes because cg animation specifically has that problem more than most industries it is a, a white man's industry um and that's a, a terrifying thing and that's why i think stories for so long have been so limited 
Um, and that that is slowly starting to change. And it's really exciting to see that from a student level that you just see like an entire world of people that are willing to make stories about completely different things other than that kind of cycle of animation we see every two or three years from studios. So it's a it's a it's a nice era to be working in, I guess. It's kind of exciting to see that that shift. I mean, that sounds really exciting. I love this idea that, you know, animation itself is a form of world building, but, but that the industry too is kind of in that process of world building and, and therefore of, yeah, diversifying the stories that are being told, the people who are working there. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Is that, I mean, how, as somebody who obviously doesn't really know very much about the processes beyond what you've just, you've just told us. Um, you mentioned some of the, the, the kind of software uh, that you would use there. I mean, is, as I would guess that this is an industry in which technology and software is so rapidly changing that, that, is that is, does that speak to why it's such a perhaps increasingly accessible and um, why there's this you know, great indie work being done? Yeah, I think partly that the, the software is getting more accessible than ever. Um, so there's a software called Blender, which is a, a 3D. I guess the way I would define it is there's 2D animation, which is you're drawing a 2D frame or something and making it move. There's 3D animation or CG animation, which is you're making three dimensional objects within a computer. And then there's stop motion, which is the idea of puppets. And those kind of three areas are the old approach. And they're kind of merging a lot more interestingly. But there's software like Blender, which is a, a open source software, so it's completely free. Um, there's YouTube now, so the world of learning Blender is easier than it ever has been. Um, and that's a software that uses 3D animation. You can draw directly in the software as well, so you could model a 3D environment and then animate a 2D character walking through that environment all in one piece of software. Whereas before, even just two years ago, that would have been a logistical nightmare. You would have had all of these different production elements trying to fit them together. Um, and so the software is getting more accessible and that's a big part of it, I think. Students and young people, I guess also kids grow up now with YouTube, just knowing that from the age of 11, when I went to university, I'd never used a 3D piece of software. I've never used Maya, I'd never, the only thing I'd use is Google SketchUp, which is very, very simple in comparison. And now we have students that have been using the software since they were 11 because you can watch it on YouTube. And so you kind of have that. Um, the, there's obviously still a big, there's still hurdles to get over in the sense that you need a computer. You need, if you want to do CG animation, you need certain technology, but that's getting better and better. It runs on easier machines. Like I can run it on my laptop easily. Um, the other thing that I think was important for me at least was the idea that animation, well, for me, it was really important that animation take place in art schools and in arts universities, because from my own experience at art school, it was lots of kids from often like the local area going into the arts. It was a kind of provincial um, old like the university I went to was Kyad Kent Institute of Art and Design. It's now University of the Creative Arts. Um, but it was essentially just your local art college. Like that's a lot of the kids there were local kids that were from working class backgrounds um, and a kind of wider, diverse range of backgrounds. And so the idea that it it was that technology and that um, way of making work was being opened up to a wider range of students from my experience was is why at university it felt so engaging because it felt like um this is accessible to us for the first time um and so i think you're seeing some of that happen as well it still obviously suffers tremendously from stuff like representation um and that's largely because the I think there's a number of issues, but I, I think a big issue is just from the top down. If you look at the industry, big films are still largely white men directing films. Um, and so it's, it's an industry that I think doesn't feel, I, I mean, I, I still often feel 
out of place in the industry because it it, it feels like the the kind of mainstay of a more like middle class um world um so it is it's getting more exciting because the hurdles are being um taken away from people um the other thing is that there are this merge of technology so um for anyone who has played video games there's one thing you'll notice is that when you play a video game on an xbox or a playstation it's all running in real time so if you um move a character around that is all running on that piece of hardware instantly in milliseconds in front of you and animation the way that i used to work was that you had to render animation so you'd have to click a button and the computer would calculate each frame frame by frame so the film i made sleeper that's a seven minute film 25 frames per second so there's however many thousand frames and it takes 15 minutes to render one frame and now that game engines have got much more accessible and easier um, people can make animation in real time as well so it's not just that the hardware the kind of software is easier to learn and easier for people to get into but also that you can output a film easier than you ever have before whereas it used to be just a, an absolute horror show of kind of production that um sense of um i guess the, the kind of lo localism of, of what it means to to maybe go to an art school um i mean is that something that you're that you that is reflected in the the work that you do and the kind of um yeah i guess this this aesthetic that that your that your what your world making comes from and um yeah um without a doubt like it was it was a thing i was i guess embarrassed about for a long time because the idea at that age is that you're someone who ventures off to a new part of the world and starts their life afresh um but i had suffered from about the age of 11 to 18 i'd had um quite a severe anxiety disorder so i'd i'd struggled with basically every single day from 11 to 18 i was having panic attacks at school and so by the time i got to 18 and everyone was ready to leave the town um i was just i, I was not in a place to be kind of really doing anything and art the local art college um it's a laughable thing now because it's not a cool that's n that's not what we're told life is supposed to be we're supposed to it's supposed to be adventure and um but for me it was like a saving i i genuinely think going to that local art college um doing a foundation year getting my degree changed my world i was the first generation from my family who went to university um so it was a, a big change and it was a thing that r really really saved me and my uh, my filmmaking is about that so i i am i i always wrestled with that notion of like um do i n not that i could ever afford this but the idea of oh uh, let's live in hackney would be a lovely thing but i do also feel a kind of connection with telling stories from um, the town I'm from specifically is just outside the Medway towns and it's a very kind of industrial um, neglected town, especially when I was 18. Um, and so I, I felt like I have some ownership over telling that story because it's it, it wasn't a story that was necessarily being told. And I, I do think one of the things I'm always trying to espouse to my students is that your stories are the important part it's not about what you think instagram wants to see from your stories it's not about a talking um cartoon animal telling a kind of general moralistic story your very specific story whether it's um growing up in a place that you felt isolated from the rest of the world or it's your um your kind of play how you feel your place in the world is your way of telling that is is kind of an important thing that we need to do as storytellers and with the kind of globalization of the world i think it also means a kind of globalization of storytelling so animation was just stories that kind of 
they weren't specific anymore. They weren't about a person in a small village somewhere or a person in a big city the, the other side of the world to you. They were about these kind of generic lands that everyone could watch and kind of understand, but not really feel anything from. Um, so I have, I feel much more at home now that that's my place is kind of telling stories about the, these kind of fringe towns. Um, and I like that. I, 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 I like being part of that. And I like being part of that community that you feel like you're reflecting something that feels honest to you. Um, so yeah, that that's been really really crucial, and it's a it's a thing that for many years I think kind of plagued me with guilt because you look around and you look at what animation is supposed to be, and you just think, okay, I don't fit in here. Um, but then you you realise that in fact it's a it's an amazing place for people to tell much more specific kind of personal stories. Um, so yeah, def definitely I I feel a, a sense of oh. Um, a kind of obligation to tell stories from this area. And what, I don't know if that will change, but I'm happy with it at the moment. I mean, it feels particularly, I don't know, uh, I guess a, a nice reminder as we're living in these weird sort of globalized world and, and Zoom and where we're conducting a lot of our conversations for the last four months has, it can kind of remove that sense of place. So it's nice to be reminded of, you know, in our practice, I think, we all are working quite closely in the in the confines of the, the things around us even as things feel globalized and, and big as we can and universal um yeah i really like I, I wondered if i might you, so you, um i mean going back to this kind of where you where you might get taught these things and you you, you do have this these localized um you know sites of, of learning and um individually being rooted in a place but i know that you do a lot of work uh, on things like twitch and Instagram. Uh, I mean, I don't know, did you want to talk about how that that kind of yes. outward yeah, display of yeah. what you're doing? That's kind of a new world to me that has occurred because of the lockdown, because in the, when the lockdown first came in, um, my students were maybe four weeks um, from their deadline date, so they, they still had this kind of the final chunk of their projects, and then suddenly they everything was kind of removed from them and one of the the most important parts of filmmaking and animation is the kind of feedback cycle that you end up ha having with your tutors or with your friends um and i know even for me when i'm making a film i need to constantly be in a discussion with friends and and people i know to kind of um sound ideas off of them um and so when that was kind of pulled out from everyone I was really worried about the idea that they might be students would obviously be struggling with mental health and what life would be like in the lockdown, but also that they, they'd be lost with their films. They'd be like, I don't know what to do. And so I started using Twitch, which largely is a video game streaming platform. So it's like a, it's where your like younger cousin might be going to watch someone play Fortnite for eight hours a day. Um, and it's a huge platform. It's like the biggest platform that no one seems to know about. Like if I ask anyone older than me, no one will know what Twitch is. Um, but it's essentially this platform for streaming video games, but it's slowly evolving. So you can stream painting or sculpting or ceramics and there's a kind of very small community that's starting to bubble up, which is people like myself who just every night, I'm normally painting on my computer, doing some development work for a film or a painting. And so I can click go live and I can have a bunch of my students kind of in the chat asking questions, asking how they might do something or asking how I, largely it's much more informal conversations. So it's stuff like how do you deal with making artwork when you're having a miserable day or that those sort of questions that it's not does this shot work in my film it's much more about the kind of day-to-day -day living when you're making a film um and so i started doing that i guess about a month and a half ago um and it's been absolutely lovely like i've i've found it an amazing experience 
I hope the students have liked it. I've had really lovely feedback from um, a number of students who have said it reminds them of being back in the studio at university where it feels like it's just that informality of chatting after a lecture or in a corridor. Um, and it's also been a good way, like I'm still able to work at the same time. So it, it's a really nice way to show them my process. Um, one thing I'm, as an independent animator, I guess, that the, the thing I'm keen to show students is that I make work in a very different way to how they see it in like a Pixar art book. And so they can see me fail and draw badly and make mistakes kind of on a live stream in a way that they're very used to. That that they understand what it's like to sit down, have an idea in your head, try and sketch out and just hit a brick wall straight away. Um, and so I wanted to kind of open up that a little bit more for the students. But more importantly, I just think it's been a lovely way for not just them, but myself to feel like everyone's still connected um, everyone can still have those informal chats that personally I, I know university is a lot of things that the experience of going to university is a lot of different things but when I think back about my own experience at university I, I can't really remember specific lectures or specific moments that a lecturer told us something and it kind of stuck the things that were always important were those kind of quick chats I'd have with my lecturer after a lecture and just show them my sketchbook and get a few thoughts um in art school and in an animation course i think that's the the kind of grounding and so twitch has kind of allowed me to do that and I'm, I'm still terrible at social media and kind of growing getting more people around that stuff um but twitch is definitely a, a thing i will continue to do because it's just been a lovely uh, a way to make this working from home life feel much less weird than it, it would be if I'd only spoken to students via email, for example. Yeah, that's really, God, this sounds like a really fascinating platform, you know, and as I guess everybody, I feel like I'm always having conversations or, or, or sort of seeing conversations happen about how we're, we're going to manage the next year or, or longer, you know, as we're trying to, I guess, trying to capture in some sense that sense, that, that idea of casual casual conversation of the way that you know, pedagogy as you say doesn't just happen by someone standing at the front of the classroom um, so I think it's really exciting to hear that people are kind of experimenting and developing with these other yeah social media forms of of conversation and discussion it's cool um to you, you sort of you've mentioned a couple of times about the way that story storytelling is really important in 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 a number of different ways and kind of building um yeah building a diff different ways of telling story and different types of story and one of the things that we're asking um contributors is about this this word literature um and how that fits in with their own practice what their what their own relationship to it is so i wondered if you had any thoughts on on that on how on how you approach literature what the word might mean whether it's useful yeah it, it is because for me literature the the idea of that as a as a concept as a kind of in at an arts university, that was kind of the the one thing that you went to art university to avoid was the idea of any form of from storytelling to the idea of even a book. It's kind of the mainstay of we do the drawing over here and the the reading and the writing exists somewhere else. Um, but I the benefit I had when I went to university was that my course leader wasn't actually an animator. So it was a, it was an animation degree, but he was a writer. He, he had no history in animation. And so he approached the course from a writing perspective. And that meant not only were from year one, we were working from, um, for example, we, we had a project on uh, Italo Calvino's invisible cities where we were concepting from that work. Um, and we, I did a strange futurist adaption of uh, The Wizard of Oz, and there was a, a kind of number of things where we were working straight from other texts. Um, but also that when I went to university, I looked around, all my friends were at other universities doing what uh, everyone else would call a real degree. Um, so they were reading books. And my friend 
like the the idea of spending your life in a library was kind of usual to them and that just became a thing that i started picking up at the same point because i thought if they're approaching it like this i need to be approaching the arts like this and uca just had an amazing arts library you could go in there and get a book on any artist any sculptor um and so i started kind of digesting that as much as possible um but i guess the bigger context of it is that um there's a book by robert henry um called the art life or the art spirit i think it's called and it's one of the books that david lynch kind of references as his big kind of motivation and in that book it's the kind of writings of his experiencing um his experiences teaching art across the years um and so it's a, a fairly random collection of thoughts and notes throughout his his time teaching um and in it he he talks very specifically around the idea of what the art life is specifically that your day-to-day -day existence should be a round making artwork it's not about project by project it's that everything that you're doing is painting and drawing and reading and writing as a way to move your thoughts and your artwork forward and that your life can become that um, and so that book very specifically kind of outlined that that became important to me so i try as much as possible to not only do very very kind of normal things um, like watching films but also doing things like reading and writing as much as possible oh, okay our carbon monoxide alarm is going off i can hear that it's going off i mean we're that brings us to a natural <laughs> close so I, i'll say thank you so much um, yes thank you Karen. i will <laughs> run and not die <laughs> yes i think you should <laughs> okay thank you Karen. bye bye, -bye.